Good morning. You may be wondering why we keep talking about the Word, and it's very simple. Because until we have faith in God's Word, we can't grow in the way that God wants us to grow. We must develop the sure trust in God's Word. We're going to talk more about that today. Um, I just want to say this, though, just a reminder for those of you who um, weren't here last Tuesday when we talked about this. Um, summer's a very busy time for me. VBS is going on at other churches and different things that take my time. So prayer meeting on Tuesday nights has been postponed until July 27th, I believe. I just looked that up and now I'm already forgetting. Yes, July 27th. Tuesday, July 27th is the next time we'll meet. Tuesday night at 6.30 for prayer meeting. We're still going through Revelation. We're up to the 6th Trump. No, 6th. Oh, no, next time we meet, I'm sorry, I got two different ones going on right now. I got one at Holton Lake, one here. Next time we meet, we go over the 144,000 in the great multitude, and I promise that by the time we get done, you will know exactly who is going to be in the 144,000, and you'll know exactly who's going to be in the great multitude, and it might be you. So you might want to come July, Tuesday, the 27th. Um, at 6.30, we're going to resume our, our midweek um, prayer study going through Revelation verse by verse. But today, I want to go into the Bible and do you make God marvel? Before we go any further, though, let's pray. Father, I just ask that you will bless as we move into your message this morning, that uh, you'll send the Holy Spirit, Lord, to let this sink in. Let our hearts and minds be moved by you. Let, let faith build inside us. Give us the, the ability or the, the, the presence of mind or whatever you need to do, Lord. Just let us dare to trust, to accept your word for what it says, and to follow it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Do you make God marvel? We're going to get into why that's the title here later in the sermon. I'm going to need a battery. Can you bring me a AAA battery? Yeah, battery's dead. All right. Do you make God marvel? There's a story... It was in the Reader's Digest. I'm sure it's not true, because I don't think it's even possible for this to happen. But in nevertheless, there's a story that's in there. And it took place on October 1995, a conversation between the U.S. naval ship and Canadian authorities off the coast of Newfoundland. Hmm. Oh, well, we'll just... Go without that today. Anyways, um, a conversation that took place between the U.S. Naval Ship and Canadian authorities. Canadian authorities sent out a message, please divert your course to the south to avoid collision. The U.S. ship fired back, you divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avert collision. Canadian authorities, negative, you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. The U.S. Navy doesn't like being told what to do, so they fired back. This is the captain of a U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course, Canadian authorities. No, I say again, you divert your course. This is the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln, the second largest ship in the Atlantic fleet. We are accompanied with three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. I say again, that's one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be taken to ensure the safety of this ship. Canadian authorities, this is a lighthouse. It's your call. <laughs> sometimes sometimes we think that we have the best plan sometimes we think we know better when in reality we just don't have all the information we don't have all the truth before us i don't know why it's not going to work today but it's not working with me today so uh the bible says psalms 119 105 your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path no 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 this one 
We can't hear you through the mic. Oh, we're just having all sorts of troubles today. <laughs> Goodness. That means it's going to be a good message. That's a good message, and yeah. the devil don't want you to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> I checked them. They look good, so don't know why. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, can you? Oh, yeah, it's much better. Okay, hold on. I'm going to do something really quick just to see if. If this will work. Nope. We're not going to get lucky today. All right. The Bible says in Psalms 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How many of you believe that here today? How many of you let the scriptures guide your path in all that you do? Amen. John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. In John 5, 39, you search the scriptures and these are they which testify of me. These are the Bible's claims of itself. The Bible is an anvil that many hammers have been broken on. It claims to be the very word of God. It claims to have the prerogatives and the authority of God. And anyone who fights against the scriptures literally fighting against God. French philosopher Voltaire, he was, a, he was a great philosopher, wrote many, many books, well-established writer, wrote poems, essays, anything, you name it, he wrote it, and he wrote a lot of it, and he was really the first commercialized writer ever in the world. And as he was writing these things, he had a disdain for the Bible, and specifically a disdain for God and the church. He was excommunicated, excommunicated by the Catholic Church, and, and, and because of the practices that they were doing, and he was calling them out for some of the wrong practices, and they excommunicated him, and he was in French, and you know the French didn't like the church either because they didn't treat the French fairly. And because of the bad practices, because of the mispractices of the church, Voltaire came to hate the, 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 the church, religion, God, and the Bible. And before he died, this is what he said. It took 12 men to start Christianity. One will destroy it. 100 years from my day, there will not be a Bible on earth except one that is looked upon by an antiquarian curiosity seeker. Crush the wretch, he said. He's, he hated the word so much that he made it his, his mission in life to destroy the Bible and to tear it down. And he said that 100 years after he's gone, there will not be one Bible left except for the one that's in the museum. Soon after he died, the Geneva Bible Society used his house and printing press to print tracts and to store Bibles. The Bible says in Genesis 2, 16 through 17, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. God gave one command in the garden. You guys know that command. He says you can eat of everything but of this one tree. The knowledge and good and evil, he said to Adam, he said to Eve, you can't eat of this. What does the devil do? He attacks the one thing that God says. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more cunning, and he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of the tree, of every tree of the garden? Then the serpent said to the woman, in verse 4, You will not surely die. God said that if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. And the devil then brought it on himself to just bring a little bit of doubt. But what was he trying to bring doubt into Eve's mind about? Not God. Huh? His word. Exactly. He was trying to get Eve to, to discount or to distrust or put mistrust or, or, or to not believe in God's word. He wanted her to divert her attention from his word so that she'd be open to all other influences. Quick question. Does God really mean what he says? Does he really mean what he says? And do you believe that? 
His word won't go void. Do you believe that? Yes. Ever since this conversation with Eve, the enemy has been trying to place doubt in our minds about the word of God. These are doubts that the enemy places in our minds, but the Bible dispels all of that. In Genesis 6, 13, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Did God mean what he said? Yes. Yes, he did. did he mean what he said? This is going to be interactive, so I'm looking for full participation from you. And I'll ask simple questions, and they will be straightforward, so you don't have to worry about getting tricked. All right, so just answer with confidence. Did God mean what he said? Yes. What if Noah did not build the ark? Jeremiah 1.16, I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness because they have forsaken me, burned incense to other gods, and worshiped the works of their own hands. Did God mean what he said. Yes, you know this story in Daniel 1, 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Did God indeed mean what he said? He said, if you don't stop fooling around with idols, if you don't stop mixing religious practices, I'm going to send you to the land of confusion because that's what you want from me. And God told them that if you don't turn from your ways, my judgments are going to come upon you. Did God mean what he said? And after he patiently and perseveringly talked to them and brought people and messages and prophets and asking them and begging them to return to him, did they do it? Did they believe God's word? Did they believe that God was going to do what he said that he was going to do? Does God mean what he says? But what if God decides to speak through a medium? Does God still mean what he says? What if he decides to speak through a medium? 2 Kings 5, 9, and 10, you know the story of Naaman. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house, and Elijah sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean." Now, you know the story of Naaman. Naaman has actually committed raids against Israel. He's taken an Israel girl to his house to be a servant. He comes down with leprosy, and she says, there's a prophet in Israel that will know what to do. So Naaman gets up the faith. He goes to this prophet, and the prophet says, go and wash in the River Jordan seven times. Just a quick geographical question. Where is the River Jordan located? It's in Israel, right? Where is Naaman from? Syria, 2 Kings 5.14, so he went down, Naaman, he went down and dipped seven times in the river Jordan according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was what? He was clean. Did God mean what he said? Did it matter that he talked through a man? No. Did it matter that God talked through a man when he was talking to Naaman? No, he said, go wash in the river Jordan seven times and you will be healed. Who said that? God did through who? Through Elisha. So if it's God's word, it doesn't matter what the medium is. Amen? If God speaks it, it has the same power as if he said it to your face, face to face. Amen? What if Naaman, what if Naaman, I'm sorry I said Nahum here, but what if Naaman would have went back to the Parpar River in Syria and, and dipped six times. Would he have been made well? No. no. Why? Because God said dip in the Jordan seven times. Does God's word mean what he says it means? Will it accomplish what he says it will accomplish? Does it matter if it comes to him speaking to your face or if it comes from some other medium? No, if it's God's word, it has the power of God's word. Amen? All right. 2 Peter 1, 19-21. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So where does the Bible come from? 
It comes from God, but it's written to us by who? By who? By holy men. What happened? We were all on a roll here. Everybody was answering the questions. I felt like there was like this synergy, this power coming back and forth, like some interaction going, and then what happened? We got tripped up a little bit. Where did the word come from? It came from God, and he wrote it through who? Through men. So he used the medium of who? Man, (laughs) holy men moved by the Holy Spirit to communicate what? His word. So my question to you is, even though it comes through medium to us, does it still have all the power of God's word? Does he still mean what he says? All right, very good. I wanted to make that point very clear because you're going to love this next quote. This is in Heavenly Places, page 134. The Bible is God's voice speaking to us just as surely as though we could hear him with our ears. The word of the living God is not merely written, but spoken. Do we receive the Bible as the oracle of God? If we realize the importance of this word, with what awe would we open it? And with what earnestness would we search its precepts? The reading and contemplating of the scriptures would be regarded as an audience with the Most High. Now I have a question for you. Is the Bible the written word of God? Is it the same as if God was speaking to us face to face? Do you believe that when you open up your Bible for devotions in the morning? Do you believe that when you claim a promise from God to help you in your situation in time of need? Do you really believe it? And if you don't, you get a spike in about that. But anyways, I can tell you this. My head tells me to say yes to that question. But if I'm honest with myself, I have to say no. I know the right answer. I know that when I come to God's word and I open it up in the morning, that I have a divine appointment with God himself. But I don't always walk away with the same confidence that the apostles walked away with when Jesus gave them a direct command face to face. Let me ask you a question. Is that God's fault? Does he mean what he says? Is he speaking to me directly? Where's the problem? She also says, The word of God effectually worketh also in you that believe, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, to depend upon it to work in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. This is faith. What is faith? To depend upon the word, the word of who? The word of God, which comes to us through what? The Bible, to do what it says it will do. Now, I don't want you to answer this question, except for in your mind. Do you believe that? To cultivate this dependence upon the Word is to cultivate faith and the knowledge of what the Scriptures mean when urging upon us the necessity of cultivating faith is more essential than any other knowledge that can be acquired. I just want to say this plainly. This is not to criticize you in any way. You know, sometimes God comes to us. He's got a message for us. And maybe it's something that we need to address. Maybe it's a little painful at first. But God wants us to deal with it. And why does he want us to deal with it? Because once it's dealt with, we're going to be better off for it. You understand what I'm saying? What we need to develop is not a knowledge not an intellectual assent that the Bible is God's word. We need to cultivate that faith into our hearts and into our life's actions. So if this knowledge is more essential than anything else, then we should talk about. Faith, what is it? How does it come? Where do we find it? How do we exercise it? Where do we find and get faith? Romans ten seventeen. So then faith comes by hearing, and by hearing the what? 
the Word of God. Now that we know where faith comes from, how do we exercise it? Go to Luke, sorry, go to chap Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 in your Bibles. This is where the sermon title comes from. Luke chapter 7. I want to show you something very interesting. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. You guys are familiar with this story. This is the centurion. His servant's going to be healed here by Jesus, but I want to point out a couple quick points in these verses. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Verse 1, Now when he had ended all his sayings in this audience of people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. So he came to certain people that knew Jesus, and he said, my servant's sick, he needs to be healed. And they come to present this case to Jesus, and what do they do? They build their case for this man, don't they? Oh, this man is worthy for this miracle. He's worthy for your divine grace. He's worthy for your divine healing. He's worthy. And then they go on to tell why. For he loves our nation, and he has built us a synagogue. He's built us a church. Jesus, this man is worthy because he loves us. This man is worthy because he's built us a church. Jesus, you're lucky that this man is with us. That's man's, that's man's work right there. We come to Jesus all too often thinking that we have made Christianity better because we're a part of it. We come to Jesus in our arrogance. Jesus, you should answer this prayer because I've done this and I've done this and I've done this. Now the centurion didn't say that. His friends did. The centurion actually had real faith. Let me suggest to you that you're going to find yourselves in one of two camps. You're either going to be like the friends of the centurion or going around thinking that he's God's gift to Christianity. Or you're going to be like the centurion himself. When Jesus talks to him, verse 6, then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. What did he say? His friends said, hey, 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 this man is seriously worthy of this. But he knows his heart. He knows himself. He says, I'm not worthy that you even come in here. You're God. I don't deserve for you to come into my house. But he knows that he needs a miracle. So what does he do? Verse 7. Wherefore neither thought on myself worthy to come into thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, until my servant do this, and he doeth it. He says, listen, I'm not worthy for you to come in here. Just say it. Just give me your word. What was he putting faith in? In Jesus' word. In the word of God. Because if God says something, does he mean it? The centurion recognizes, I'm not worthy of what you're going to do here. But you have the ability to do what I need, and I'm asking you. I'm crying to you, God, because in your word you said that you would give mercy to those who cried to you. In your word you said you love those that cried out to you and asked you to do those things. In your word in Jeremiah 33, 3, you said that if we call upon you, do great miracles. And now I'm calling upon you, but I'm not worthy of what you're about to do, but I'm just asking that you say the word to make it happen. And how does Jesus respond? Verse 8. All right, verse 9. When Jesus heard these things, he did what? He marveled at him. Why did he marvel at him? Yes. 
he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, those same ones that came and said he was worthy. He said to them, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. He marveled at the centurion because he believed his word. Had nothing to do with any action he ever did for Jesus. God loves it when we donate to his church. God loves it when we do great things for him. But he doesn't love it when we think that that gives us some kind of favor with him. Because we could do nothing unless he gave us the ability to do it. We wouldn't have the money to build a church or to donate to church unless God gave it to us. We wouldn't have the strength or the energy to do any of those works unless God gave it to us, nor would we have the desire unless God came to us and changed our hearts first. There's nothing that we do that makes us worthy. It's all about Jesus. But what makes Jesus marvel is when we just trust his word, when we believe that he will do what he says he will do. That's what makes Jesus marvel. That's what gets Jesus excited. He says, finally, you're going to give me a chance to do what I want to do. Because the only thing holding them back is who? Me. You. We're the one. Jesus says, true faith is trusting in my word. True faith is depending upon me to do what I say I'll do. Trusting in my word, depending on the word. So what is faith? Faith is expecting the word of God to do what it says it will do. The first chapter in the Bible has a lot of instruction. The first chapter has seven statements that inspire faith. Genesis 1-3, then God said, let there be light. Genesis 1-6, then God said, let there be a firmament. Genesis 1-9, then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Could you imagine if the light said, oh, God, I'm not coming? Is that even possible? No, no what if the waters are just like, nah, no, I'm not separating. Do they even have a choice? No, because God said it was to happen. Genesis 1.11, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree. Genesis 1.14, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament. Genesis 1.20, then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament in the heavens. And then God said, let the earth bring forth a living creature according to its kind. So how did God create the world? By his word. And when he said that something was to happen, when he commanded it to happen, do you think he meant what he said? Are you glad that he meant what he said? When you look around and you see the beautiful sunshine, are you glad that God meant what he said? When you see the beautiful clouds floating over your head, are you glad that God meant what he said? When you see those beautiful rivers that cool you off when it's so hot outside because of that sunshine that God made, are you glad that God meant what he said? Do you believe that God means what he says? Then you have to believe that by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Whatever God commanded, it happened. The spoken word of God is what caused this world to exist. Now, this is the point that we're driving to. Jones and Wagner, Lessons on Faith. This is Lessons on Faith, page 10. Thus it was in creation, and thus it was in redemption. He healed the sick, he cast out devils, he stilled the tempest, he cleansed the lepers, he raised the dead, he forgave sins all by his word. In all this also he spoke, and it was. And always he does all things by his word only. And always he can do all things by his word because it is the very characteristic of the word of God that is possessed of the divine power by which itself accomplishes the thing which is spoken. In other words, God is saying to us, it is through my word. Trust my word. You need healing? Go to my word. You need victory? Go to my word. You need instruction? Go to my word. You need encouragement? Go to my word. You need comforting? Go to my word. Whatever you need, it's there. It's in my word. 
That is why it is that faith is that is why it is that faith is knowing that in the word of God there is this power expecting the word itself to do the thing spoken and the depending upon that word itself to do which the Lord which the word speaks. Do you believe that? Do you believe that when I open the Bible and I find that promise from God that he's speaking to me directly? just as if Jesus was here speaking to me. Do you believe that? Does he mean what he says? Then the word has to change you. The word has to change me. Because if God says it, it's got the power to accomplish it. Teaching of faith is the biblical principle that the Word of God will do what it says it will do. Raise your hand if you all believe this. How many of you believe this? Raise your hand. We all believe that, right? Amen. But the cultivation of faith is the confidence that the Word of God will accomplish in my life that which it says it will do. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think we lack the first. I don't think the understanding is the problem. I think the cultivation and depending upon God's word to do it is the problem. Because if you're anything like me, you know all too well what it's like to pray for God to help you and then to get up off your knees and call everybody you know and try to figure out how to do it yourself. The problem isn't the knowledge because we all start out going to God. We must cultivate the confidence that the word of God will accomplish in my life that which it says it will do. So let's talk about this. Habakkuk 2, 4, Romans 1, 16. The just shall live by what? By faith. What is faith? Depending upon, that's a great answer. Depending upon God's word. Trusting in Jesus, right? Trusting in God. That is faith. Trusting what they did. Now I'm just going to pause here. I was visiting this cancer patient. She didn't have much time. The doctor, the oncologist looked at her and said, we're going to treat this to prolong life, but we're not going to cure this cancer. It's a very aggressive form of cancer, and they can't operate. They can't do anything but give chemo. Man has no solutions for this woman's problems. I looked at this woman said, are you saved? She said, yes, I'm saved, but. Yes, I'm saved, but. Where does that but come from? Then she performed. She, she went on to talk about what that but was. But I'm not doing what God wants me to do. I'm not following God. I said, so are you saved? Well, confidence started leaving her. And I just want to pause. The just shall live by faith. Faith in who? Faith in Jesus. Because it's not about what you do. It's about what he did. And that is the principle that you will have to wrestle with more than in your life than any other principle because the devil is going to come and try to cast doubt at that point. It's about Jesus. It's not about the church that you built. It's not because you love the nation. It's because Jesus loved God and he loved us, and he lived a perfect life, and he died for us. And everybody who's saved is saved the exact same way. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did. And when you trust the word of God, when you get to that point where you say, Jesus, I am yours, and I just want to do what you want me to do, and you trust the word of God, it won't be a question about performance because you'll be doing everything that God wanted you to do. 
if you love me, keep my commandments. We might as well say that when you love me, you're going to do this. It's going to happen. The just shall live by faith. How exactly do they live by faith? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. They believe the word of God more than they believe the own thoughts in their mind. More than they believe what society and philosophy teaches them. They believe the word of God. That means that the word of God, whether spoken or written, determines my experience. My experience doesn't tell me what God's word says. The word determines my experience. Do you understand the difference? If I'm living by the word of God, it's going to change me and my experience is going to be in harmony with it. Oh, darn it, that's not working. Bad habit. 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. How many of you have sin in your life? How many of you want to escape the corruption that brings you down? How many of you want that? Mm -hmm. Jesus said it is through the promises of his word that you are changed. That's what he's trying to tell you. It's here. It's right here. And he's saying that this has the same power as if I was here on earth speaking to you directly because I am through my word. It doesn't matter what medium God chooses. What matters is that it's his word and it has his power attached with it. So let's get practical. We'll start from the outside and work our way in. Exodus 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, You know the Ten Commandments. I'm going to skip to the fourth one. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Did God mean what he said? Yes. yes. Does he expect us to rest on the Sabbath day? Yes. Why? Because he gave us a what? A command to do what? To rest the seventh day. And why did he give us that command specifically? Because it's a memorial of creation and redemption. He says that if you spend this day focusing on what I made it for, a memorial of my creation, a memorial of my redemption, if you spend this day focusing on this, Satan is not going to have the same power to get you to doubt my word. He won't have that power. This is a daily, oh, sorry, this is a weekly Lesson builder. A weekly lesson of faith. Weekly lesson of building faith. I don't know how to say it, but that's what it is. Matthew 20, 19 through 20, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Faith in the word inspires us to share the truth of God's word, no matter our present ability. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. You don't have to know more than everybody out there. You just have to know a little bit more than the person you're leading to Jesus. That's it. If you know one text more than them, you can lead them further than they're at. You understand what I'm saying? It's not about my ability. It's about the Word of God. And just saying, I'm going to share this with everybody. That's what I'm going to do. What about Bible prophecy? Revelation 13, 16 through 17. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one that has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Bible tells us in Bible prophecy that there is a time coming very soon that there is going to be a mark of the beast. Now, as Adventists, we all know what this mark of the beast is, but he tells us explicitly that if you take, if you refuse to take this mark, you're not going to be able to buy or sell. But if you do take this mark, you're going to be destroyed. Does he mean what he says? Yes. That means that if we take the mark, what is going to happen? We're going to be destroyed. But if we stand with God's word, we're going to resist the what? The mark. Verse 17, or chapter 17, verse 5, and on her forehead the name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of the harlots and the abominations of the earth. I just want to say, before the mark of the beast is mentioned, the seal of God is presented in Revelation 17, Revelation chapter 7. That means that God's people are sealed. 
He finds a way to seal them before he talks about this event that's going to happen. He says, don't worry, something bad is going to happen. But those who are with me, they're going to be sealed. They're going to fly right through it. Why? Because they have put their trust in the word of God. Does it sound like a broken record yet? Have you heard it enough? The word of God, the word of God, the word of God, the reason why is because we have the knowledge, but are we cultivating it? Are we cultivating our faith? One day, just like Noah, what we preach will be a present-day reality. Why? Because the Word of God has said so. Now let's move forward. Revelation 14.1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion with him, 144,000, having his Father's name written on their foreheads. Verse, or chapter 14, verses 4 and 5. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes, and in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Brothers and sisters, this should be a promise to you that no matter how you see yourself today, God can help you to live victorious lives. God can help you to rise above what society says is acceptable. God says that there's going to come a time where I'm going to have those sealed who follow me fully. And who is that? That is anyone who puts their faith in the word of God. Matthew 19, 4 and 5. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? I hate to tell you, this is the biblical definition of marriage. This is what Jesus defines marriage. It's between a man and a woman. I don't care what society says. God's word tells us differently. God's word tells us that this is is what marriage is. It's between a man and a woman. It is not my mind that tells me what I am. It is God's word that tells me what I am. My mind doesn't tell my body what it is. God made my body the way he wanted it. It's God's word that defines who I am what I am, and how I practice my life. And the best news I can give anybody who struggles with this is that if you believe that God's word has the same power that created the world out of nothing, then he can take the desires that you have and he can recreate them to like what's in harmony with his word. He can change you completely and fully, and he'll do so if you trust his word and put your faith in him. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Philippians Philippians 3, 9, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness, which is from God by faith. Do you believe that God forgives your sins when you confess them? Do you believe that God cleanses you when you confess your sins? Then that means that someday, somehow, as I continue to put my faith in the word of God, he is going to make me that sealed saint that marches through the end of times. Not because I believe it, not because it's my, I'm sorry, not because it's my reality, my reality, not because it's my experience, but because his word says so. And if I'm truly being consistent and my belief, and being consistent that he means what he says he means, then I have to believe that he is going to make me just like him because he told me that he would. My whole sermon can be distilled to one verse. Matthew 3, Matthew 4, 3 through 4. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, (coughs) excuse me, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There is only one biblical way to live, and it is by the word of God. There is no other outlook. There is no other philosophy. God makes it simple. He says, Live by my word. If I say it, I mean it. If I've asked you to do something, 
I'll give you the ability through my word for you to accomplish that which I've asked you. Do you depend on the word of God? Amen. Maybe some better news I can give you. If you don't depend on the word of God, then you can claim a promise from the word of God that will make you depend on the word of God. This is the most important truth that there is. The devil, from the very beginning, tried to get Adam and Eve to doubt God's word, and he was successful. But the second Adam came, Jesus Christ. He went through the wilderness, fasted for 40 days with all his great disadvantages, and he sat at that tree. I'm sorry, he sat at that wilderness face to face with the devil. And the devil tried him to get to doubt what? God's word. He tried to get him to doubt God's word. But Jesus remained firm in his trust of God's word. And he's asking us, put faith in my word. Depend upon it. If you read it, and it's saying that the change is needed, let me give you some quick advice. You're the one who needs to change. Now let me give you some hope. God's the one who's going to change you, and he's going to do it through his word. If you apply this to your life, you will walk from victory to victory. Defeat will be a thing of the past. You will keep on moving from victory to victory to victory. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. God can make you resemble his word. Just as God healed the centurion servant with his word, he can bring that same healing to you. Do you believe his word? Do you believe his word? We lost that interaction. Do you believe God's word? Do you trust his word? Is it going to accomplish what it says it's going to accomplish? And that means that as we continue to go to God, He's going to steal us. He's going to perfect us. Do you want to make God marvel? Amen. Our closing hymn. Our closing hymn is number 278.